This is the 79th Security Thought Leadership Webinar. And we've been here every Tuesday and Thursday where we've been discussing some topic of interest to the broader understanding about how we make people safe and secure, how we make communities, how we make organizations more safe and secure. And the idea of thought leadership is that we think today about what's going on in order to generate ideas for a better type of delivery and a better type of situation tomorrow. Um, and the topic today is one that has been at the forefront of previous webinars, where people have been asking, what about the victims? And there is one sense in which it's been argued on previous webinars that victims are the forgotten people of the criminal justice system. And on the other hand, there are those who have raised the issue about whether there's a, a way in which the concern to support the victims has started to erode the rights of offenders and got in the way of justice. Well, we thought, what about holding a webinar? And today, once again, we have three panelists from different parts of the world, the United States, Germany and United Kingdom, who come at this from a very different angle. So what I'm gonna do in a second is I'm gonna ask each of the three of them to introduce themselves. And once they've done that, I will then invite them each to make their opening statement. Now, as you know, uh, uh, once all three have introduced themselves and they've made their open statement, we'll come to you and get some questions and discussion going about this. We've got some questions in advance. I'm aware there's several things going on around the world today. Uh, um, so uh, do get a go your questions in early and we'll try and incorporate them best we can. So without further ado, then I'm going to ask my uh, panel to introduce themselves. And first and foremost, we go over near Frankfurt and speak to Bianca. Bianca, can you please introduce yourself? Hello to everybody. My name is Bianca Bieber. I'm the CEO of Weisering, which is the only nationwide organization of victim support in Germany. I'm very pleased to be in this panel today. Thank you. Bianca, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Neil, back to the United Kingdom. Um, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Neil Masters. Um, I'm a policy advisor for CIFAS and the former chair of the government's joint fraud task force. I've spent the last 20 years working on victim and witness related issues. Thank you very much indeed. And from Britain over to the United States and one of the leading academics in the whole world on this topic. Mangai, introduce yourself, please. You're on, uh, you're on mute, Mangai. Hello everyone, Mangi Natarajan from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, the City University of New York. I'm very pleased to be here and I am a crime prevention specialist and also currently working on how to really find innovative ways through digital platform to help victims of domestic violence to safe to provide safe and security for them. Thank you very much indeed, Manga. One of the things we've been hearing a lot about on this webinar in this about how lockdowns have caused uh, dramatic changes in uh, domestic violence. So um, excellent work. Okay, without further ado, then I'm going to ask each of our panelists to uh, make their opening statement. Three minutes where they get the chance to say what they think is going on in the area. And uh, over to Bianca. Bianca, your opening statement, please. Well, um, the criminal proceeding has, of course, two aims, uh, which is to determine whether an offence has been committed, a crime, or to bring the perpetrator to a just punishment. That said, means that in the centre of the process, of course, is the offender. Nevertheless, it became increasingly clear that victims are also more and more more important than just being mere evidence. So in Germany, like starting in the 70s, it started with gaining more rights for victims. We have a lot of important rights that came up, like 1976, for example, the criminal, uh, the crime victims compensation. Interesting, it's the same year that my organization, Weiser Ring, has been founded. So it started really in the 70s to bother about victims' rights. And so we had a lot of other important legislative um, executions, like the witness protection law, which is a very important thing we as a victims organization um, accomplished. We have a very important, just as you said, for domestic violence law, the Protection Against Violence Act, which was enacted 2002. And so very many more legislative things that came up also in the last 15 years. Of course, in Germany, a lot was then in the last years developed from European legislation. And 
Um, Germany has a high level of uh, legislative regarding uh, the victims' rights. Uh, and of course, I think we really can say that in the last 50 years, victims have written more and more legal rights and have more than just the role of being a witness, an active role, and are getting a little bit um, yeah, more equal in this procedure. But they still struggle. And the interesting thing, and I think we will get to this in our discussion, every right they get follows immediately a discussion for um, from the side of the accused in criminal, the defense lawyers, like more victims' right means weakening of the rights of the accused in a criminal process. And so we always have to struggle about this uh, topic. So it is essential now to prevent uh, steps backwards. We have a lot of discussions with the uh, uh, defense lawyers. We have, for example, a very, I'll just give you one example. Um, the, um, you have like making the law, the process more complicated, more during that it takes a longer time because of increasing rights of the victims and that makes processes not handleable anymore. This is just an example for the argumentation they have. We as Weisering, and this is my closing statement, um, have to ask whether a reduction of the right, rights can be justified, therefore, to make proceedings more convenient or quicker or more efficient. And of course, as victim organization, I say victims' rights are human rights. They are sacrosanct, indivisible, and not negotiable. So simply said, if it's taking longer, if it's making the process more complicated, that's the way it is because it's the right of victims we have to take care of. So this is my starting statement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was an excellent introduction into the uh, situation and for many of us an introduction to Germany for the first time. So thank you very much mm -hmm. indeed. For that. Uh, can I just remind the audience question and answer button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. And we now go over to Neil. Neil, your opening statement, please. Good afternoon. I've been in the criminal justice system of now for 47 years. And when I first joined in 1973, I joined the Metropolitan Police Prosecuting Department, and they prosecuted most of the mainstream crime in London. But in 1973, we didn't have victims, we had complainants. There was no victim services. There was no pretrial therapy, uh, as that was considered to have, taint, to have the potential to taint the evidence of a victim. Uh, you got what service the police officer in charge of the case was able to provide to you. And very often the service to victims was a call to tell them that they're required to attend court and a call to tell them that their case is on the following day and which court they have to attend. The sole focus was on criminal justice outcomes and that meant that victims got a pretty raw deal. In fact, it was only in 1974 that the first victim services pilot um, was established in Bristol, but it took another 12 years for victim services to be established across England and Wales. And it took a further year for the government to recognize that such services which were provided by charities need to be centrally funded. So as we, as we exited the, the, the 90, early 1980s, um, we had some dramatic changes with the introduction of the Crown Prosecution Service. And this for the first time, victims were actually engaged with by the prosecutor and the prosecuting authority. It wasn't perfect, but it was better service than they had before. And, and the 1990s really were the watershed for, for us in this country um, with the establishment of the witness service, which focused on supplying, um, supporting victims and witnesses at court special measures such as the ability of certain categories of victims, those that are vulnerable or intimidated to give evidence behind screens uh, or for the courts to be cleared. But these were, these were only in certain offenses, not in all offenses. Pre-trial therapy, there was a protocol and pilot schemes because the legal, legal fraternity was still very jittery 
around victims having therapy and counselling before they gave evidence. And some excellent work around domestic abuse, which I'm sure we're going to hear of uh, a little bit later. The big breakthrough came in 2006 with the introduction of the Victims Code. This was a code established by statute, but wasn't a statutory code, if that makes sense. It sets the minimum standards as to the level of service victims can expect from the criminal justice system. And for the first time um, with the code, we had obligations on service providers, such as the police, the prosecutor, the courts, etc. And along with those obligations came time, time uh, frames. Um, so we had a nationally consistent service by victims because we had now the charities across the country providing the, those victim services, and we had the code. But all changed in 2012 with the introduction of the Police and Crime Commissioners. And in 2014, we went from a nationally funded and um, commissioned victim service to a locally, a locally commissioned victim service by police and crime commissioners. In devolving the service from uh, the Ministry of Justice, there was no service standards or ring fence monies. Police and crime commissioners were required to assess the need and commission the services locally. Um, so we moved from a single provider and national service, albeit not perfect, to a service that was reliant on where a victim lives and what services a PCC commissioned. But as we know, crime doesn't fit neatly to geographic boundaries. So where there are multiple victims spread across the country, they will get access to different services. Well, some will ask, well, this, does this actually matter? Well, I would argue that it actually does. There needs to be some form of consistency of approach. I think an added factor is that um, some police forces have now bought victim services in house. Where you have a victim who has no confidence in police, they now lose the independent voice that an independent provider gives them. So what am, I, what am I arguing? I'm arguing that there should be a national victim service framework, that victim services are commissioned against this framework with a degree of consistency, a greater focus on evaluating what works in service provision. I don't think we really necessarily always understand what a victim needs. And a time of challenging financial settlements, monies will need to be ring fenced so that PCCs know the monies they need to spend on victim services in the area. A couple of pet issues. Final, final point, Neil, because we've only got a little bit of time. Yeah. Pet issues, victim satisfaction surveys, we see a lot of them mentioned, um, but they only report on services the victim receives, not necessarily what the services the victim might need. You don't work, know what you don't know. And later on, I'll talk a little bit more about the new approach to a victim's code, which we introduced in April 21. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you. So that's um, two of the panellists. Let's um, just remind you, question and answer banner at the bottom of your screen. I'll come to you straight after our third uh, panellist. Uh, Manga, your opening statement, please. Yes, victims are underserved by the criminal justice system. For the discussion today, I'm going to focus on victims of domestic violence, which I've been working the research on working on several years. And the two main agencies that have direct contact with victims are the law enforcement, court or justice system, both are to assist victims for many reasons, especially the outcomes of physical, mental and sexual abuses and the repeat victimization. Apart from physical, open physical injuries, they experience various forms of trauma, anxiety, depression, PTSD symptoms, inability to trust others and so on. The most underdeserved among our teens, women, people of color, particularly black and Latinx racial and ethnic minorities, sexual minorities, immigrants, especially undocumented ones, those with lower English proficiency, people with disabilities, those with inadequate transportation and or living in rural environment or locations. Criminal justice professionals, mental health providers, victim advocates among others, confront unique challenges in ensuring victim access to comprehensive and effective services. There are many barriers and concerns about the existing capacity of victim service providers to adequately meet the victim needs. Studies have reported, including mine, there are several needs, about a couple of dozens of needs, but we can really squeeze them into emotional and psychological recovery, 
assistance with concrete and tangible needs and the needs for transformation that is advocacy with the justice and other system. Further, there, are, there is a dire need for safety and low cost legal services and housing for victims. All time need is the counseling service. A 2008 national representative study of victimization in the United States found that only 18% of the intimate partner violence victims received victim services. And also studies showed that the staff are burnt out and overextended considering the budget impasse. Referral agencies have been falling apart. Very few programs are operating. And so there is a long wait list. Agencies have adapted their services to focus primarily on crisis needs. Many of them are seeking philanthropist funding than the government ones because of the lack of uncertainty, uncertainty of funding from government sources. All these are putting strain on service providers. This has become worse during pandemic. In April, the United Nations Populations Fund predicted six months of lockdown measures could lead to 31 million more cases of domestic abuse globally. My concern here is, are we equipped with resources to help these people, these victims who are going to come to us? The pandemic increased domestic violence calls in the United States and all around the world. As a matter of fact, reporting inter intimate partner violence is an issue during this pandemic. For police forces are offering online options and others requiring in-person visits. Victims were unable to safely connect with services during COVID. Digital applications are emerging to assist victims and survivors of domestic violence and then their family members. Because of the nature of domestic violence victims and their needs, police cannot offer them everything on their own a multi-agency cooperation is needed in assisting victims during this pandemic. For immediate intervention, the hospitals, medical clinics can do an evaluation uh, during this, uh, during, and also the telemedical uh, tele 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 um, appointments, during those appointments, along with social workers, they can provide safety planning and directing them to right resources or services that they need. That's what they need to do. And then the service providers have to continue to screen the screens for a screen for intimate partner violence and discuss their safety planning with their patients during these appointments. And there is a dire need to really help out these domestic violence victims, especially during this COVID pandemic because you all have seen many of the other crimes have dropped down, but the domestic violence, no doubt it is on the increase and the domestic violence victims are going through the COVID pandemic and also the intimate partner violence pandemic. And we need something to redo and help to safeguard the rights as well as security of these domestic violence victims. Mengai, thank you very much indeed. Well, look, three excellent uh, insights. Um, uh, I'm going to come to uh, Bianca first, if I might. Bianca, um, question for you. Uh, Mengai there was outlining the sort of rather dire situation that's been going on in uh, 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 throughout lockdown. We've heard about this. We had a webinar where Rajiv from India was talking about the extreme amounts of violence which was being tolerated in homes in India. Uh, which was really quite a, a, a sort of shocking uh, insight. What's been the situation with regards to victim service during COVID in Germany? Bianca first, please. The official numbers are really different. We have like official numbers increasing 30, 40, 50% in this first responder houses. We have also from police in another country or region the response there is no um, significant increase but i think that's the visible part which are just official figures we as victim organization know and we also have an increasing part of um, support for victims of domestic violence we know from all other situations like holidays or something 
um, that this is the period, just as we heard before, where domestic violence is taking place because you have all the stress factors all together, like you have people being together in tiny places with a lot of people being stressed, having fear of loss of job, having other stressful events. Um, so this is the situation for domestic violence and, and abusive um, relationships. And of course, the perpetrator is there. So this is no wonder for us as Weisering. It's no wonder that in parts of official numbers, you don't see it yet in Germany because the victims don't have the possibility to get help. And that's our experience. You get it after, for example, after the first lockdown, it took a while and then we experienced more and more needs, supports, questions of support. But definitely it's the crime of the pandemic, which is from all we know of this situation, which is the, the, the crime that is happening now because of lockdown also in Germany. But it's normal. They, it's, uh, domestic violence is always, they, the most of people don't go to police, don't, um, of the victims, because it's a part of this crime. It's like in relationships, it's um, being, being ashamed, not wanting to, to offend the perpetrator, the violence person. So we will have a long time after all this COVID-19 where we will have to deal with victims of this peak of domestic violence, yes. Okay, and here's Mengai, here's the point. This seems to be a worldwide issue. I'm not saying it happens in every country, but certainly the evidence from these webinars is this is a pretty, pretty global issue. We get the problem, okay? And you outlined the resource constraints on the same time, okay? So where do we look for solutions for victims on what is a, um, a serious, serious issue? Where do we go? What, what's the solution? What can we be, how can we think about this differently? The solution is, you know, the, you know, especially, you know, uh, we, we talk about women, uh, especially domestic violence victim. And in the United States now, because of so much of problems, the people of color, especially black and brown color people, and they, they are sort of hesitant to go and ask any help with the police. This is a, another situation. And in some sources, this, because that is, that is a that is a service provider in you know the, the police department also cannot really do everything because there are so much so many needs police can really direct but they cannot provide all these services so it is a holistic approach that we have to really look into you know you know we have to look at where these victims access to access for help especially the service providers this uh, the shelter homes and medical clinics so these are the organizations that could be really helpful, especially the immediate intervention for the victims that is needed. And all the more, what I have been saying is the survivors are going through hell a lot of problems because they are trying to really get over from this victim, victim mode. And now because of so much of problems at home, they are sort of, you know, it's sort of coming back to them and they are restless and they are becoming worse. And again, I'm going to, you know, this is, this is again, a, we have to look at a holistic approach and we have to pour, you know, the criminal justice system pours a lot of money on offenders. I think they should really put more money on victims also. There is a balance. So in, in that occasion, and they can really integrate and involve many uh, social service organizations, fund them because they are underfunded. And also say, for example, in, in, a, in a shelter, you will have only 15 to 20 people at a time they can they can take and you have so much of people waiting and how do they, how can they decide about who could be getting in so this is a, is again a rights issue and it's an ethical issue for those organizations too so there is plenty of problems and it's it, it can be solved only by integrating or having a long discussions with the funding sources government and non government sources and also this agencies that could really directly provide. And especially if we don't really, you know, as Bianca said, it, it is a, the domestic violence is always hidden and victims put everything to themselves and then they never talk about it. And this pandemic, because they are facing a lot of problems from outside and inside, 
and it's going to really burst out. And once the COVID pandemic is lifted, then you are going to see quite more problems in that front. And we need to be prepared to help them now and after we lift the, after the pandemic is, lift, uh, uh, is lifted. Thank you, Mangai. Appreciate the point. So, so very similar view there. Neil, let me come to you. You mentioned in your opening statement about the victim code being introduced. Yes. To what extent, um, without going into too much detail, because it's a global, global audience here, um, the victim code, is this really going to, just very briefly, what is it? And is it really going to make a difference? Uh, it is going to make a difference because we're moving through uh, the next 12 months to put the victim's code on the statute books to make the obligations the, the object of, of statute. Uh, the simplification of the code, which is a subject of consultation earlier on in the year, will take what was what quite a complex and lengthy document, and it will make it, it will now um, enshrine 12 rights that victims will have. So it will be much easier for victims to, to understand what their services they should be receiving and what the timescales are around them and how those who are vulnerable are able to access the what we call enhanced services, which have uh, much tighter timeframes for the organisations to deliver. Um, I think that the challenge with the victim's code is, is the fact that when not, not everybody knows that there is a victim's code and in fact, understanding of the code is quite rare. Um, you could argue that until you're a victim, it doesn't really have any relevance to you. And I, and I think that's an argument, but there needs to be a, a much wider understanding of the code. There needs to be um, a better means of complaining where the services uh, service provided to a victim is poor. The victim at the present time just has to go back to the, the uh, organization who has failed to provide that service for which they're complaining. Uh, and only then, if the service provider says that actually that's not been a, uh, we, ex we, we don't accept what your complaint is, is saying, can they go to their MP who, who can then refer them to the ombudsman? That's too clunky. There needs to be a much sharper um, means of complaining. Uh, and uh, I think the Victims Commissioner's Office need to play a role in there. Can I just say in answer very to quickly, Mangai, yes, to Mangai We've also seen domestic abuse in this country go up during during the, the lockdown. Um, but we've also seen two other crimes rise, and that's romance fraud and um, investment fraud. Uh, so they're the sort of three areas that we've seen rises while other crimes have been falling during that period. Neil, thank you very much indeed. Appreciate that. Bianca, I want to come to you about a statement. Question from Simon Chan that uh, he wrote to me in advance about Bianca, actually. But in, in your opening statement, you put clearly this issue of victims versus offenders rights, right? And a lot of the debate about victim services is couched in how we get the balance between the two. Simon Jones' question was about bringing offenders and uh, victims together, uh, um, restorative justice as it is called. Where are you personally with that Bianca? Um, is, this, uh, is this seen to be in the interests of uh, victims needs and um, are, are you, is your organization, are you a supporter of it? Bianca. Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> Um, so, so, a restorative justice, we have this uh, system, of course, in Germany too, and we as Weiser Ring have it in our uh, main principles to, to um, help victims doing this, but I personally um, saw both sides. I saw cases where it was really relief for the victims and where victims were ready to, to do this, to, to see, to understand and to talk with the perpetrator um, and to, to, to get to peace. So this was a very good time to do this. And we also experienced the other side where um, the accused person is doing this, of course, to get a lower, um, punishment at the end of the process and where, where victims experience that it's not the personal wish of, of um, the, the criminal to, to come to peace with a victim or to explain or to say sorry, however, um, but just to get a relief in, at the end in, in the measurement of the, the punishment. So um, I think there are cases where it's very helpful and a really good institution and it helps both sides. And it can be 
harmful and our part as victim organization is to check very carefully with the attorneys with the victims with with everybody involved is this helpful or not yeah thank you bianca i mean it's interesting just out of interest i was with an offender recently mm -hmm. and i said to him would you be interested in going to meet your victims mm -hmm. he said, absolutely and i said why he said because i'd like them to know it wasn't personal wow. and he was a fraudster, okay, and he was saying to him it was a target, but he wasn't. Uh, um, but of course, as you say, the mindset's got to be right, and uh, uh, and good. okay, let me move on because we've got so many so much stuff coming in. Uh, Mango, I want to move on to a slightly different uh, question, and David uh, Nesadore from uh, Malaysia has asked a question, uh, um, um, and it's, and this is the issue of suicide um, from domestic violence. I mean, now this is just taking this to a, another magnitude of of issue here. Mm -hmm. But I think it's an important one, and I see that Bianca's body in the background, it's a really important one. Uh, and his question is about, I suppose, what I, the way I put the question to you, is this something that victim services are aware of? And do you believe that uh, um, we're on top of the issue as a as service providers and in terms of our thinking about it? Perfect question to ask you, Mango. Yes, certainly. The studies have shown that because they didn't have any out from the situation this is the last resort that they take commit suicide you know committing you know thinking about suicide committing suicide and studies have shown that this is one of the last resorts the victims especially domestic violence victims too because there is no other choice that they can live and then they think this is the best way to really end their life and studies have shown that and i also wanted to respond to the question about res restorative justice here in india we have women police stations they 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 are the one they just help in the way of restorative justice they bring both the parties together and especially even the families together to talk about it and discuss about this and to solve the conflicts that are happen that happen and are to be happening and this is a very interesting uh, setup, which is a you know, though it is a sort of uh, criticized as a segregated uh, policing, but it is not. It is a restorative policing. It is a procedural policing. It's a problem-oriented policing, and it is a community policing to really deal with the specific problem of domestic violence. Restorative justice does work in those situations, and and it also links to what I'm going to say about the suicide because if the problem is sort of solved at the beginning, if the victims know, or if they can be assessed at that early stage, and this restorative justice will help to really deal with the problem, and then not ending up with the suicidal attempts. So this is another angle that you have to really look at. The, the assessment of the victim's position is very, very important. And if they do it earlier, if they sense there is a conflict, there is an issue. So at that time itself, they can really solve the problem. And it also solves the problem of themselves and also solve the problem of the entire family. This is very, very important. It's not just we are talking about the victim, victim and the family, the children who are mostly affected in this domestic violence situations. Yeah, you know, it's one of these things that's cropped up quite a lot on this webinar about um, intervening early and effectively. And uh, it's, it's a bit of a common theme. Neil, I want to come to you now. I know you raised an important thing, of course, just to say for our audience who may not be familiar with uh, you, you're, you're very well known in the victim's world in terms of support of, in the fraud area. And you mentioned two frauds there, investment fraud and indeed uh, um, romance fraud, two dramatically impactful offences on victims. Uh, um, um, you could argue, um, and some victims do argue, worse than being punched and being hit is losing your life savings or losing your, your personal security financially. Neil, I wonder whether I can ask you, where do you think we are in terms of victim services for that sort of victim? And um, Bianca, I'm going to come to you afterwards with the same question. For the fraud victims, for the financial crime victims, often the forgotten people in a different way, Neil. I, I think around fraud victims, where you have romance for fraud, you have um, a double whammy. You've not only have you lost often a substantial amount of money, off the, the average loss is around 11,000 £11, pounds um, each victim in romance fraud, but you've also lost the relationship. And um, that you will be so socially engineered by the, uh, the fraudster 
that um, you actually feel that that loss quite dramatically. So any victim services have to address not just the financial loss and the impact that that might have in romance fraud, but also the loss of that relationship and to get the individual who uh, who has suffered this loss. And, and very often uh, people of a certain age are targeted around this. And, and uh, we have many situations where victims don't actually realize or even believe when they're spoken to that they are victims of such crimes. Investment fraud is significant because at a time in your life when you need your, your particularly around pensions, you need, you need uh, to uh, make good your future going forward, that you've lost all of that. And that can have a dramatic effect on individuals, but also a dramatic effect, a ripple effect on families because the impact of, of the loss of so much money may mean that going into retirement, for example, is a situation which um, many are unable to do, so they're forced back to work. So it has a dramatic effect on, on, on people. Thanks, Neil. And, 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 and within the forgotten world of victims, the, the fraud victim in particular seems to be forgotten. Bianca, are you onto this in Germany? Can we, are you, can we look to you around the world for an example of how to do it well? <laughs> I hope so. Well, romance fraud is something we have increasingly um, victims of, and that is something like a victim organization can deal very well with, because it's exactly as we just heard, it's the loss of the relationship, it's all the psychological factor which is coming apart from the loss of money, which affects victims terribly and really needs them to give a full support like till psychological support. So this is something I think we all can handle very well. Um, the investment fraud can of course be dramatic and also we as Weiser Ring have a lot of, for example, older people who lost their, their rent, who don't know, who don't have the chance to, to cover up by work because they are already not working anymore. And so it's very dramatic, but of course, civil society, because maybe I should add Weiser Ring is completely private financed and has no state funding, state money funding. So of course, we cannot make a compensation of that whole loss. So I think from the uh, personal point of view, we can cover that very well from the financial problems. It's, it's, a, it's a problem for the victims that they will not get full coverage by, by society or by the state, of course, and it can be dramatic. So Bianca, your job is just uh, to counsel them and, and help them. I mean, the, the, that's as far as you can take it. Yeah, we, we can, we also, we pay also. We are an old organization. We are like 43 years old now. And so we have a, a good amount of private funding so we can help out. And we also do financing. I mean, it's dramatic. There are people we have to finance. For example, the fridge is broken and they can't afford the fridge anymore because they lost so much money. I mean, we have really heartbreaking stories behind those technical um, sounding um, investment frauds. And we also can finance um, going to a lawyer, going to, to a psychologist. But all the most of this investment fraud um, situation is cyber crime, most of it, at least at what order increasingly. And so you often have no one to get uh, no, no, no perpetrator to get after or you're really helpless. And I think that's something also the, the police and the prosecution is always behind those cyber crime techniques because they are building up their cyber crime competence and techniques and everything, but the criminals are always one step ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you very much indeed. Interesting points, actually. I'm gonna move a little bit quicker if I can, we've only got a few minutes left and I wanna get a few questions in. Uh, Mangai, Ruth Andrews asks about whether we need to provide a um, special psychological, psychological service, psychological service to help victims. Um, so that they can help break some of their uh, uh, some of, so break break the cycle of deprivation, or break the cycle of pain that goes on, and of course, in some ways, uh, um, as Bianca just said, it's a statement. Obviously, we ought to provide psychological services in terms of what they need, but funding priority realities, it's not going to happen, is it, Mangai? Yes, you know the thing is, unless the government and some philanthropical help, it's it cannot really happen because that is you know, as I said. 
whether it is immediate situation or intermediary situation or long-term situation, the counseling services, psychological services are needed for the victims as well as survivors. So we, we forget about the survivors because they, we don't want them to become a victim of uh, second, uh, secondary victimization. So we need to really just balance the victims and survivors. If we have to really help the psychological, the counseling services are very, very important. And the assessment is also important to really help what sort of services that are needed. And, and the funding is the issue because say, for example, in developing countries, you know, we are talking about developed countries. We have at least some money left given to given as a portion for victim services. But in developing countries, you know, they are grappling with so many other problems, and and it's very hard for them to really set allocate for victims. You know, the the services and funding for the uh, uh, services for victims, especially domestic violence victims, because it's you know it's almost sort of denial many of the many of the countries. So how are they going to really give resources to the domestic violence victims or survivors. So this is sort of complicated issue and, and it, it is a worldwide issue. And as I said, this, this pandemic is going to increase quite a lot of the problems and we are going to have a table full of problems and we need to solve. But the one issue is the tangible one that we can do is provide all the psychological services that we need. And say, for example, the schools they can give, and the colleges, universities they can give, and some workplace that they can give all the services. So this is this another way to really expand the services, psychological services, counseling services for the victims or you know, victims of domestic violence or uh, 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 you know, any, anyone as a matter of fact, if they need help. And psychological services are very, very crucial in this term, in this time, because everyone is upset and you know they they are sort of suffering from so many issues alcohol issues you know home home issues and you know job issues and also coping up with you know locked up inside because you know i see nine months i mean inside the house so it is yeah. sort of sort of frustrating for every other moment but we have to calm down because i'm i'm sort of psychologically i have i'm been counseling my own self so so calm and collected with dealing with things and that helps so okay. So if, if that helps to me, it is going to help everybody. And it's a very good point, I think, to bring it out about um, um, internationally in the developing countries. That's cropped up in these webinars. I need to get one more question. I'm going to come to you, Neil, for it, because um, it's right up your street. If it is I hope I pronounced that right. I, I generally do get these wrong, but I apologise. Courier fraud. That's a good one, actually. Yep. Rising in UK. Are we educating people about courier fraud? Neil, we've only got about 90 seconds. Can I just ask you in 90 seconds just to give us your insight on this particular offence? Because, and from a victim perspective in particular, just explain what it is if you wouldn't mind. Courier fraud is when you're contacted and uh, you, are, uh, you are persuaded by social engineering to provide your credit card details because you believe perhaps you're assisting a police investigation or assisting a bank investigation. Um, it's, a, it's a real problem. It is increasing. There was an operation earlier on in the year as part of an operational tello where career fraud was clamped down on in this country and was, and was very successful. But we are seeing it increasing. We have seen it increase a little bit during COVID and post-COVID. Um, from a victim's perspective, again, very impactful offence and very often older population targeted. Yeah, and very, 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 very nasty sort of stuff with it. Neil, thank you very much indeed, panel. I'm going to come to you with a ridiculously difficult question because it's not only a difficult question, you've only got 10 seconds each to answer it because we're running out of time. From each of you, on a strategic level, if you could have one wish, given where we are right now in the world, what would you see as the single most important thing that we could do to help victims? Bianca, 10 seconds if you wouldn't mind it, Bianca. We have to answer as a civil society. States can't do this. We have to do this together to help victims. Thank you very much indeed. Well, excellent. Mangai, 10 seconds. What can we do at a strategic level? Yes, you are not alone, victims or survivors. And we all have, we have to work together. And the government needs to really shed a lot of money for us to really deal with the problems and you are not alone and we are together. So the, you feel safe and sec secured in your home and the rest have to come through from outside and our rights.
Thank you very much indeed. And Neil, 10 seconds, no more, we've got to go. Enshrine, enshrine victims' rights in legislation, make it enforceable and obligations on service providers with sanctions. That would make a difference. Yes, okay, please. panel, thank you so much for your time. That was absolutely outstanding. There's so many issues we could have gone on, and I think we will do. We'll, we'll, um, we'll run these issues again, I'm sure, in the future. My grateful thanks to you. My grateful thanks for the questions as well. We had many in advance. I didn't actually get through them all, uh, um, but fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So much more we could do. And um, what the panel are clearly saying is we're saving up a lot of problems here that are going to come back and bite us in due course. Beware, beware. OK, very finally, a few final points, if I might. Just to say, if you watched, um, um, if you didn't, weren't aware, the Tackling Economic Crime Awards took place yesterday. You can see who the winners are in tackling some of the offences that Neil in particular was talking about today. Absolutely astounding show. Look at it. The techers.com Tackling Economic Crime Awards happened yesterday. Find out who's doing a good job. Um, next to say that um, um, on Tuesday, the German, uh, we have a webinar all about security in Germany, you'll be pleased to know, Bianca, about where it's yeah, going and how it's doing. And uh, um, it's 3.30 on, uh, on Tuesday, and also the presentation of the German Outstanding Security Performance Awards straight afterwards. So webinar first, awards afterwards. Let you know that the OSPAs are open in South Africa and open tomorrow in Nigeria. So um, if you're in those locales, look out for them. Um, just to say uh, something else, by the way, the research study going on, Mankai will be pleased with this, the use of forensic digital information, social media data is so important in prosecuting offences, particularly sexual offences and those in violence against women in particular. Uh, we want to know your views on the use of social media and how it helps or doesn't help. Um, short survey, please, if you've got 10 minutes to spare, we'd like to hear your views. And uh, just to say, finally, Tuesday, German Ospers, there's a webinar about the response in Germany to COVID-19. And uh, the final webinar of the year is on next Thursday, where my guests include Baroness Ruth Hennig, uh, Professor Gloria Laycock, and uh, Dennis Shep. So I uh, look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Finally, uh, a thank you to Hannah and Christine in the background, who are fantastic as ever. Uh, uh, thanks again to the audience for joining in, and there'll be a lot more who will be joining uh, uh, later, and especially my panel for their insights. That was fantastic. And uh, don't forget, a copy of this will be on the website tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world, until we meet again, stay safe.